um, the answers have been in front of us since we were born. But when you go to verse uh, uh, 13, after you have this golden rule, therefore all things whatsoever you desire that men should do unto you, so also you should do unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. Then he says, go in through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are the ones entering in through it. For narrow is the gate, and constricted is the way that leads away into life, and few are the ones finding it. Now, interesting, the next verse says, Beware, but beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inside they are plundering wolves. For their fruits you shall, from their fruits you shall know them, do they gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles. So every, true, every good tree produces good fruits, but the corrupt tree produces evil fruits. A good tree cannot produce evil fruits, nor a corrupt tree produce good fruits. Every tree not producing good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire. And surely from their fruits you shall know them. So, so then it, it continues on. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of the heavens or of heaven, but the one who, ones who do the will of my Father in heaven. Well, what is that will? It's returning to innocence in the, sermon, in, in the, in the, in the golden rule in Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever you desire that men should do unto you, so also you should do unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. And then, um, so, so that is the will of the father and the mother, I might add. And then verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons, in your name do many works of powers. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, those working lawlessness. And of course, when we live in an age of absolute lawlessness, where every religious group claims to have the truth while they're all lying. And all of them are lying for one reason and one reason only, to keep us all debtors, to keep us all sinners, and to keep us under the complete control of a system that was structured to enslave us and our children indefinitely forever. But, of course, Jesus presented the truth 2,000 years ago, and Frank is revealing it today, and here we are trying to express this thing uh, one more time. And, and then he says, uh, verse 24, then everyone who hears these words from me and does them, I will compare him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, and the floods came up, and the winds blew and fell against that house. But it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and who does not do them, he shall be compared to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down, and the floods came up, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell, and great was the collapse of it. So. And that's the little conclusionary thing after that. What, what, I'm, what I'm laying out here is this. All religions that were structured to divide us, and every man who put himself as a leader had a responsibility to tell the truth and didn't. And Jesus addressed that in John's Gospel in John chapter 10, verse 1. And he introduces a concept that's very harsh, and nobody likes to deal with it, and that is, is that people that are paid to lead other people in spiritual ways, but lie, are called hirelings, and stand judged the moment they open their mouth and lie. I'm not going to read it. But you guys, it, it, this is really a powerful passage where the, the sheep are supposedly to be, they're supposed to be protected by the shepherds, and these false shepherds come along, and of course they, they scatter when danger comes, and they don't protect the flock. And that has been the responsibility, and, and, I, and I, this is not to brag on me, but when I went to seminary um, I, in 1983, I started at a conservative Protestant seminary in California, uh, Talbot Theological Seminary. Um, I was always asked, what was I going to do when I graduated and finished? And I kept telling them, I don't know, because I don't know anything yet. And I left that school before I finished it, realizing they didn't know anything. And um, there's a line that Joseph Campbell quotes in a, uh, and I'm sure he didn't originate it, um, in, a, in an interview with Bill Moyers back in 1987, 86 and 87, and the quote goes something like this, he who thinks he knows doesn't know. He who knows that he does not know, knows. And the reality is all these people have put themselves out as teachers all these years, claiming they knew, and they've all been proven to be liars, many of which swore secret oaths to secret societies of which they lied more and more and more, and every time they get in a pulpit or every time they would talk to somebody, they'd lie. And I, I have to say this also, that you, I have no idea what the numbers are because it was a lot, but how many people that when I was working with evangelism Mission from D. James Kennedy out of Florida and um, Campus Crusade for Christ, the four spiritual laws and all the different things that I was conditioned to use, 
um, to, uh, to to tell people that they needed to repent of their sins and make a confession to Jesus Christ to be saved. I realize now, looking back on my life, every time I started to do that or I did it with somebody, I got sick to my stomach because something inside of me was telling me that this was not the truth. And the truth is we always had the truth inside of us. That we, that we, were, we came here to find out if we could keep from being defrauded and, and lied to and find a way back to where we came from, which is the divine creator, which we're all part of. And so I would suggest that this, this is my list of reading material um, and because I, I had to come at it from a scriptural perspective as well. I had to, I had to undo all the things that I was mysteriously holding on to. Um, but I would go back to uh, onefaithofgod.org, and I would look at about the Nazarenes, and I would read the story about Jesus. I would, and maybe along with that, go to oneireland.org, and I would read the book of the Green Race, um, Liber Klonglas, or Liber Klonglas. I would read that. I'd read the, look at the timeline, and I would look at that book. And I would also, from there, I would go to oneevil.org, and I would read the Dea Magisterium. I think it has in PDF, it's only like 42 pages. And then I would go from the Dea Magisterium to the website on Soul Code, sol.code.org, and read all of it. It'll take you about an hour to read the whole thing. You'll probably have a trouble getting through the scripture section there at first because it's going to be a shocking eye-opener. But um, it'll reveal how we were originally created and how we were created not to be wicked at all, that we were created to uh, be have, 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 by an accident, purely as Frank has laid it out, that this was a fluke, that the beings that created us put all their power in us, not knowing that combined all their knowledge and all their energy together was a direct access to the divine creator, male, female energy of the universe. And that was placed in us. And that was placed in us. And... Um, and that, and that was then, of course, according to the soul code issue, and I don't know if it's in the Dea Magisterium exactly the same, but that these characters that created us, um, which is not the divine creator, but other created beings using DNA manipulation and other things, um, they, uh, they were so afraid of us having this knowledge that we've, we're coming to right now that they, they took the Adamu and created him and, and recreated him out of the dirt and put this counterfeit soul in him, and that's what we've been struggling with. And that one call that Frank addressed with Ron when Ron asked, where does this heel come from? And Frank used the illustration of having a little car, like a Mini Cooper, with a jet engine on it, propelling that car really fast. And then Frank mentioned what would happen if you put two jet engines on the top of that thing and you put them in different directions. And Ron's conclusion was it would tear it up. It would be gone, be destroyed. Well, and Frank alluded to the fact that that's our bodies. That's how we were created. That's our bodies to self-destruct, and we've been playing their game for all these thousands of years, gr- gladly self-destructing because that's what they wanted us to do. And then a group of people came along a few thousand years ago and figured out a way to manipulate the rest of us while well, they had this knowledge. And I know that Frank uh, comes from the Quillian line of the Holly Kings, and uh, you know I can't prove this on mine one way or the other, but I my family last name was a very, very... A rare Greek last name, and I think my family line goes back to Philip of Macedon and one of the other uh, bloodlines of Philip, which would take back somehow to the lines of Akhenaten. And I believe that, and I had I had a revelation given to me back in 1983 when I was in Thessalonica, not even knowing the significance of it at the time, that showed me that answers were going to be given to me, but in, inherent in the way it was told to me that it was not going to be for my own gain. It was going to be for all mankind. And I wasn't to use it arrogantly or anything else. And then when I found out later on that summer, in August of 83, that my family members ancestrally were the Therapeutae and the ancient lines back to, which would have gone back to Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, and the rulers of northern Greece and Macedonia, Philip Macedon, I realized that what's happened is, is the divine creator has pulled back bloodlines that were supposedly lost to the insanity of the system to actually help free mankind and then end the bloodline thing once and for all. And I contend with Frank that bloodlines now from this point forward are over, but it took men and women to come back and find out who they were to bring this thing forward and to free the human race once and for all. So I believe that we can live outside of this counterfeit soul. We don't have to deal with the duality anymore, that we can live in this love and harmony and even have, and that's why the, um, the covenants 
uh, packed into singular as Callum and the covenants of um, one heaven, you know, divine law, natural law, the new cognitive law coming out, and positive law, and ecclesiastical, administrative, all these things are structured in such a way to do it in a way out of love, not out of obligation and, and a need to destroy each other. I believe that now war is obsolete, that the need for people to attack each other is obsolete, and anybody who's traveled around the world has been welcomed in lands where there's supposed to be an enemy there knows full well that people don't want to attack other people. Uh, you know, and I, and I that people naturally want to welcome other people and be welcomed into the homes of others that were supposedly their enemies. And if, if this comes to fruition, which I know it is coming to fruition because that's why we're here, um, we're setting a, 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 a wonderful cycle for an age of peace that we're actually freeing even the people that have enslaved us. And this is where forgiveness comes into play. And if I'm not mistaken, I think what's happening here with what you, Ron, and others have done with uh, sending these final notices, these two, two papers with four, uh, two sides each to uh, um, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, was to that these, these people too were trapped. You know, I, I need to consider, but Frank has seen that these people were all trapped in their system, that they were bred from the time they were children to play this role that they didn't think there was a way out and they couldn't get out. And we know for a fact, uh, we've discussed this, that there's been people who've tried to get out and they end up getting killed. And so others have just stayed in the game to keep playing the game. So somebody outside the game who never swore any oath, never took an allegiance to the game at all, had to be the ones to free them. And I, for one, have never sworn an oath to any of their games. I'm, I'm sure you haven't, Ron, and Frank hasn't, and others. And what's happening is those have not sworn oaths are now are now freeing those that did who couldn't free themselves. And so if this is as I think it is, and because we have the power inside of us, our own will, uh, like Frank was talking about, that the sun has a treaty. We have a treaty in one heaven with the sun and the earth and all the entities that are known as Satan, Lucifer, Moloch, all the rest of the words, and all the rest of them, Michael and, and all the rest of the archons, archangels. If this is a peace treaty to free them also, then we're actually freeing everyone, not just on this uh, planet, but maybe everywhere in the whole universe is being freed by this. And what, what you've done, Ron, and others have done is to free uh, the, the, from the position of being pontiff under the Romanist pontifex anymore. And we're literally, by doing so, we're freeing all of mankind. All of, all, all, by freeing them and breaking the trust of the presumption of us being slaves and them being a slave first, the servant of servants, slave of slaves being freed, we're all being freed. We're completely free for the first time in the history of mankind on this earth. And I, I, that's, and, and I, I, am, I, I get a chill when I think about the fact that what we're doing is, and like when Frank used the illustration, I love that parable of the lion who was out of control with a thorn in his paw and, a, and needed a mouse to pull it out. You know, we're the mouse to free the lion. So now the lion and the mouse can uh, live together in peace and now all of us can be at, it, at the way we originally were supposed to be designed, which were to live outside of wickedness, to live under the golden rule, uh, to live in innocence. And um, now, instead of uh, attacking each other and being out to destroy each other, we, we set the phase, we set the, uh, phase of, a, of a new world. And I, I want to throw a couple things out. I was going to bring these up with Frank, and I, I didn't, but he's mentioned one of the movies, so I imagine he's seen the other ones. Um, there was a movie that he's talked about several times with the blood of Mithra, Gladiator, when the um, character played by um, Russell Crowe is, is walking down the first runway to go out to the arena where they pour blood on him. And that, of course, is evidence of the Mithraic blood system. And um, that film was made by director and producer Ridley Scott. And then uh, Ridley Scott did another film five years later. So I think the first film was in 2000. The second film was uh, 2005 in the same series, and that is called Kingdom of Heaven with Orlando Bloom and Liam Neeson and uh, Eva Green and uh, Jeremy Irons. And it's absolutely probably one of the finest movies I've ever seen in my life. And uh, if you've studied the Golden Rule and you understand true Gnostic teachings, there's all kinds of symbols and different things in that film that show you a process of letting you know, letting all of us know, that the highest connection between all of us is the spiritual connection that we have with each other, knowing that we're all part of the divine creator. And when men and women come together knowing that, there is no division. There is no Islam. There is no Catholicism. There is no Judaism. There's just people. 
and you see this film is so beautifully done. Um, and I'm not going to give all the clues away, but I think everybody should watch it about ten times. 